It has helped to make our world what it is, and that is part of the problem of economic growth. Can we afford to keep making and consuming more and more and more on and on? Welcome to Roundtable. Hello and a very warm welcome from me, David Foster. Bigger, better, faster, more. That is the mantra of economic growth, a model that sustained the world economy for generations. It has improved standards of living and made a few people very, very rich. But in a world of climate change and rising inequality, can we carry on like this? Money makes the world go round, or so they say. A cliché that sums up the world's primary economic model, growth. That is the increase in goods and services that a country produces and how much they're worth. The theory is that growth leads to an increase in incomes, allowing people to buy more and improving their quality of life. More wealth, less poverty. But critics point out a couple of major problems. One, they say, is an increase in inequality. Growth can be kind to those at the top, while the poorest get left behind, and our social fabric suffers. Growth also means more raw materials extracted from the planet. The more we grow, the more we use, and the more we pollute. Campaigners say the growth model has caused the climate crisis. And as the world population continues to surge, more people using more stuff might stretch the world's resources and ecosystems to the very limit. OK, let us get talking with me at the round table. We have Catherine McBride from the Institute of Economic Affairs. Professor Raina Cattell is here, political scientist at University College London, and Kate Rayworth, who's an economist and author of Donut Economics. Welcome to the programme, each and every one of you. You'll explain what Donut Economics is in just a moment, I hope. Uh, but Kate, first of all, it's, it's a bit like blowing up a balloon, isn't it? It cannot go on forever growing and growing and growing. One day it's going to burst, and that's our planet. Well, that's the way we've been heading. That's certainly the signs, all the signs we're getting from the way we've been putting pressure on this planet. The only living planet we know, delicately balanced with a stable climate, fertile soils, protective ozone layer overhead, that is what gives us life. And yes, the growth of our economies has met people's needs for health and education and food and housing, but the way we're doing it is pushing our planet beyond its life-supporting systems. So what if you don't have growth? What do you have? Do you, do you have um, contraction? Or what, what's the alternative? Well, think about children. Think about flowers in the garden. Growth is a wonderful, healthy stage of life. We love to see things grow. I love seeing my kids grow, the flowers growing. But nothing in nature grows forever. Growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life, and then things grow up. They mature and they come to thrive. And then they die. No, well, yes, ultimately everything dies. There's the spoiler. Everything dies mm. and the sun will die in five billion years. We've got a little bit of time before that. Can we thrive on this planet? Because at the moment we are growing in a way we'll, we'll push ourselves into collapse and that is what we've got to avoid. You see, the thing is, Catherine, it, growth is necessary or it has been necessary to get us to this point. Can we carry on the way we are? I think we will carry on, but we'll carry on in a different manner. Um, you probably aren't old enough to remember the good old-fashioned American car that was about the same size as this room. Um, and it took people to suddenly, the petrol price to go up in the 70s, to people to rethink that. And they started making smaller cars that were much more fuel efficient. And then we got into hybrid cars. And then we got into electric cars. And I think that's probably the new growth is rather than make a bigger mess, there is a point going back to the children, you know, where the teenager has to learn to tidy up its room. And I think our next stage of growth is going to be in uh, this today. In fact, there's a meeting in Germany of yeah, people who've invented new ways to deal with CO2 and turn CO2 back into limestone. Um, or which perhaps is, use it in fizzy yeah. drinks. That was another yes. one of the things they were talking about. And so we could actually make a new industry out of using our pollution. Certainly there's the, a university in Amsterdam whose name escapes me, but they are looking at recycling plastic back into the, the um, oil that it came from. But, but isn't this a question of just running fast just to stand still? 
at that particular point? Because at the moment we have, what, six billion people approximately on the planet. By the time we've got 10, if the same amount of resources or perhaps even fewer resources are available, each one of those 10 billion is going to get a smaller slice of the cake. Well, one of the great things about that is that all of the, when the, the big growth in the middle class is happening outside of Europe, it's happening in um, China and India predominantly and Southeast Asia. And they are going straight into the newest possible technology. So if we can make the newest technology fuel efficient or electric cars or electric power, that's what they'll go into. You know, in Africa, they didn't bother with the landline. They didn't even go with the fiber optic cable. They went straight to mobile phones. And so we've got to make sure that that new technology is, is not polluting technology. Hey, That's listen, the um, you're all experts. Don't wait for me to ask a question. <laughs> if, if you want to talk expert to expert at any point, then, then do so. But, Brian, I'm going to bring you in at this particular uh, point. Can you measure society's success by growth? Well, yes and no. I mean, this is what we have been doing over the last 50, 60 years. I think GDP growth has been the mantra of, of politicians, but also yeah. the business press, everybody basically, even scientists. We have been looking at the, uh, GDP growth as the, you know, the, the measure of success. And I think by now we realize that this doesn't work. The GDP growth actually tells us fairly little because we don't ask the question what kind of growth we have. And I think this is really the, where the question gets really complicated. I think I agree completely that we can't go on like that. We need new industries. But of course, then the question is, what kind of industries do we need? And then I think this is where the question becomes not just about industry, but also around institutions, around politics, whether we can go on. So we've been sold a lie, yeah. really. No, no. You, you have to measure it somehow. Yeah, sure, exactly. It's, you know, it's, yeah. it's not a great measure, and but it's, it's a measure. You know, but isn't it a bit like sort of Gordon Gekko, you know, greed is good. Growth yeah, is well, good. I think the story of the 20th <laughs> right. century, it was the century of the monetary metric. In the 1930s, Simon Kuznets was asked by US Congress to come up with one number to measure the output of the American economy. He did. It's what we now call GDP. He also gave it with a caveat. He said this number could scarcely be used to measure the welfare of a nation. Don't do that. Right. We ignored that. Yeah, and we got obsessed true. with GDP. <laughs> by the 50s and the 60s, there was a horse race on between the US and the USSR. When the OECD was founded, Article 1.1 was to sustain the highest sustainable rate of growth, GDP growth. Mm -hmm. And so we got addicted. And we, we ranked the world's but, countries in terms right. of their growth rates. But whose benefit was this? They did... Well, I think, in a way, it was the benefit of really economists and policymakers who showed that the world. you lot. This is, yeah, partially, yes. This is a way of seeing if you were making yeah, a difference. Simplifying but it. also the way they calculate GDP, they can include government spending in it. So you could actually have a whole lot of government spending and make it look like it's GDP growth. So it's, you've got to be a bit, you've got to look a bit more granularly into the numbers than I think people have been. But also the benefit was that back, let's say the latter half of the 20th century, from the 1950 to 2000, there was a pretty strong correlation that if your economy was growing, it was a labor intensive economy, it was creating jobs, yeah. middle class people were getting better off. So you could talk about the economy growing and it showed up as improvement in people's lives. That correlation has broken down. Uh, but, so but let's go back to this, um, dwell on it for just a moment. Uh, did it mean that people were easily exploitable in this situation? If industries were growing, if workforces, people had jobs, but they could have jobs at um, relatively low pay, little reward, not just in the UK, but, but around the world, because their living standards were slightly better than they had been before, but nothing like as, as good as those at the top who were reaping all the rewards. So in countries where workers were unionized and actually had the power to bargain for a decent wage, growth, I think, gave returns in terms of wage increases. What we've seen in high-income countries and ones where the unions have been split up, we've seen absolutely, as economies have grown, the returns to shareholders have been increasing far, far beyond the returns to wage earners. They've almost been flat in this country, in the US and others. So it depends on the workers' ability to bargain for their share in that growth. And that has really been broken down. And, and you said that took us up to the, the turn of the, the century, the, the new millennium. Thereafter, it started to go wrong. Didn't well, it? In, and of course, it was before the new millennium, back in 1992. Yeah. Yeah. The world's governments all together recognized that growth was not only bringing better lives for many people, it was also bringing climate change, 
and it was actually going to undermine the life-supporting systems of our planet. So a much bigger effect from outside of the daily economy. They promised in 92 to act on it, and we've, we've absolutely failed to act on it or anything like the scale required because I think it is so in tension with the pursuit of growth as we've known it. OK, so, so you, you say things have to change. The idea is perhaps for you at this table to come up with those uh, means, of, means of change. Well, but, Riley, you wanted to say something first? Yeah, no, I think the climate change is one thing, but inequality is, is, is another really key issue that has been uh, growing over the last 30 years, really. And uh, here, actually, GDP is a quite good indicator because we can look at the share of labor in GDP, and this has been steadily decreasing. So how much the workers really get from the GDP, this has been decreasing over the last 30 years, almost in all of the developing countries. Developed countries. And I think that's really the part of the problem, that we have been moving away from a model that was in post-war yeah. area to something completely different. But in terms of what could we do instead, I mean, there are these sustainable development goals that you know, almost 200 countries have signed up to, which are m much more than growth. They're about inequality, they're about climate change, they're about justice, all of those key issues that we should use as measurements. And some kind of Difficult governments though, isn't it, if, if somebody's yes. going to lose out financially, um, but, but actually to convince we're... people that that's the right way of doing it, because those at the top, with all the money, have all the power. And they, they might pay lip service to this, but things don't really change. Well, they, they, unfortunately, I think in, in not only is Labour getting a smaller piece of the pie, and I do agree with you, I think one of the reasons that um, Labour forces have lost their, their strength, and I was a child in the 70s and I remember the massive wage um, uh, strikes we used to have, um, is because we opened up our Labour force, we have a, a lot more immigrant labour, and we moved labour-intensive um, product making outside of the UK into places with cheaper labour. So we either got cheaper labour here or we found places with cheaper labour there. And, um, and this completely undermined the ability of labour to get a piece, uh, the, the labour force to get a bigger piece of the pie, if you like. But I do think that there is, unfortunately, um, I'm not sure that shareholders have got as, as rich as some company bosses. And they've got very cosy with governments all around the world. And they've got very good at playing governments off. So they like yeah. to make a, a, a car in five different places so they can then, oh, well, if you don't do what we like, we'll close down our factory in your country and move it to someone else. They're, it, they're excellent at this. If, if this is about sustainability, in other words, the, the endurance of our home, the, the, this planet, mm. um, then there's going to have to be some cold turkey somewhere, isn't there? Well, sometimes we actually overcome these things, which we did in the 70s when people thought by the year 2000 we'd run out of food and water and fresh air. And suddenly the um, biotechnologists got involved and we actually increased the yield on almost all grain products. So we actually have more food now than we had in the 70s. So we got much better at producing food. So sometimes when you see a problem, you learn how to, to, to find a solution. But it is taking that problem seriously, as yeah, you said. In a moment, Kate, because I want to ask Sorry. you about donut e economy. I think the, the key, key word really is the learning. So who should be doing the learning? I think that this is where we have been really forgetting some of the key lessons from the past 200 years. And we, we think that the markets are the only ones that can, that can learn. And forgetting that all the governments, but also labor movement and other social movements should be really at the table discussing the direction of the economy should be taking. And I think we are too much relying on the market as a, a sort of an outside force that we can't really uh, emphasize, uh, you know, change the direction of. But I think, oh, sorry. I, I want okay. to, yeah, no, I want please, to, let's, okay, let's, okay. let's you respond okay. to that, but yeah. tell us about um, donut economics and, and the seven deadly sins in just a sec. Oh, that's a lot to say. In All right, well, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll narrow it down a bit. Okay, so I want to disagree partly, since it's yeah. a privilege to respectfully disagree. Yeah. Uh, I think there's a danger that we think that technologies will come along and sort out problems of former kinds of growth. So a green revolution and we will solve the world's food shortage. Yes, we've produced more food, but the environmental impacts are extraordinary. There are dead zones in oceans the world over because far too much fertilizer has poured out of the fields into the water. Pesticide use is, so all sorts of rebound effects, unexpected consequences of technologies are why we have such an extraordinary planetary crisis. And I think there's a real danger of believing we can just forge on with growth and don't worry, engineers and experts will come up with new technologies to fix the problems of the old. I don't think that's going to keep working. In fact, I think there's evidence it's not working, which is why we have such a planet 
under pressure in so many ways. In, in which case, um, tell us about donut economics and tell us about the biggest deadly sin. Don't tell us all seven. So mainstream economics, I studied it, maybe many of us studied it at university, it just jumps right in with, welcome to economics, here's the market. It jumps right in and starts talking about the market and how it, it works. It doesn't... The market being us, those who consume yes. The market yeah. being supply and demand yeah. and the price mechanism of businesses and consumers. <coughs> it's a very clever mechanism. A Adam Smith was absolutely right. But we have to start somewhere else. We have to start with purpose. What is the economy for? Because if we don't know what the economy is for, how on earth do we think we're going to measure success? We end up falling back on some sort of proxy like GDP, which turns out doesn't tell us very much. I wrote about donut economics, silly though it sounds. It's a compass for the 21st century, and it looks like a donut with a hole in the middle, a bit like this table. So I'm going to use the table. So imagine humanity's use of Earth's resources radiating out from the middle of this. The hole in the middle is a place where people are left falling short on the essentials of life. It's where people don't have the resources they need for food and water, healthcare, education, housing, political voice. We want nobody left in the hole. The SDGs mean that the world's governments have agreed... SDGs, Sustainable, sustainable, sustainable Development, development goals. goals. Sorry. No acronyms, please. Yes. <laughs> the Sustainable Development Goals show that all the world's governments have already agreed that all the world's people have a claim to living a life out of that hole of deprivation. So get everybody out of the hole in the middle into the donut shape itself. But, and this is a very 21st century but, we cannot use Earth's resources so much that we begin to actually put excessive pressure on Earth's life-supporting systems. We begin to kick our planet out of balance. We are causing climate breakdown. We are acidifying the oceans. We've created a hole in the ozone layer. We're killing off Earth's life systems. We have to come back within that if we ourselves, part of nature, <clears throat> want to survive and thrive. So the donut is a compass for 21st century prosperity. Meet the needs of all people, nobody left in the hole, within the means of the planet, don't overshoot the outside. And it's about balance. And that to me is the most <clears throat> critical change we're going to make. The 20th century is obsessed with this ever rising growth, up, 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 infinity. That is nothing. That is not how anything in nature thrives. Nature thrives in balance, and we know it in our own bodies. Our, our health lies in balance, and our oxygen, food, water, exercise, but not too much. I actually agree with you, and I've read your book, and I, I absolutely understand that there is, with any mathematics, you have an, a bound, if you like, an upside and a downside bound. But um, things like the ozone layer, we did fix once we recognised it, and we knew it was a problem. And it is now getting smaller, and they've taken the CFCs out of all of the the um, uh, refrigerations. And the same thing has happened with pesticide use. It's actually going down everywhere except Europe where they refuse to, to actually use new technology in, in crop development. But the rest of the world has lowered their pesticide use by like 39%. I mean, really lowered it. So it's, we can work this out, but consumers must demand it. And I'm shocked by the use of plastic because when I was a child growing up in Australia, we didn't have plastic, we had brown paper. We had brown paper bags, we had cardboard boxes. But I did a programme last week in which people who know about these things say it's right. darn sight more difficult to, to recycle or use or make a, plastic, a, a paper bag than it is a, a plastic one. It takes a great deal more resources to make the paper one. Well, that may be true, but I do know that we live without plastic. So that, you know, I know we can live without plastic. We had milk bottles. Now, you, there'll be some people in hospitals um, that used to have to sterilise everything. Everything had to be put into little bags and put into a massive sterilising machine. Autoclave. Yes, and now it's all plastic. It gets ripped out. They use it once, throw yeah. it away. Now, maybe that's plastic worth keeping, where meanwhile, everything that I find in the park every morning when I walk my dog is plastic that we could live without. Rani, do say something, because then I've got a question for three I of think you. the really the key issue for yeah. consumers, for instance, is to understand the interconnectedness of yeah. the world. I mean, if, if, if I want to become more, uh, you know, better green consumer, I can buy an electric car. But of course, that needs electric batteries that are made out of yeah. rare metals that yeah. are, you know, excavated under horrendous conditions in South America and increasing actually the environmental mm. problems and inequalities and all that. So I think for consumers, there's really a long way that, that uh, both probably the governments, but also especially, especially the private companies have to really make clear what are the interconnections yeah. of these products okay. and processes. Can we, I, we, no, I want to disagree that it's all up to consumers because I oh, think yeah, that sure. puts an outrageous Th this amount is where of I was, pressure on yeah. people Going to know to everything about what's in every product. Because they've been sold that's that's that idea, that it is there and it's, and it's fine to use it. 
Well, first of all, when you go into a supermarket with a reputed name in the UK or whatever country in the world, you expect the supermarket to be selling things that are made decently, that didn't exploit people, that didn't kill the earth. You sort of expect yeah. that. Now we're told, oh, no, it's up to the consumer to choose this one and not that one. These products, if products... How do you are, know, anyway, if you've been lied to in the past? You can't possibly yes. do it. We can't possibly read all the details. And I think it puts excessive onus so, so on individuals. We need okay. governments to put in place Therefore, my regulation. question is, yes. if, if it's not the consumer, and I was going to suggest that the consumer yes. can't be blamed for all of this, if it isn't the consumer that's made us arrive at this point where continued growth is, is such a bad thing, whose fault is it and who's preventing the changes that you suggest from taking place? Well, I think it's the vested interests of industries that make and use the single-use plastics, that depend upon fossil fuels, that don't want to change because they're making a good amount of money out of it, thank you. So they quietly lobby around the back of governments to prevent them from putting in very sensible 21st century regulation like we are phasing out fossil fuels within a couple of decades, we are banning single-use plastics, we are banning landfill, get with the 21st century, modernise your production system. When I talk to people who work inside some of the major consumer goods companies, they've got some of the smartest chemical engineers and designers who would absolutely love to unleash their knowledge and actually design products that are free of plastics and that are using new technologies that live without this damage. But they're stopped because the front line of companies is a lobby group that goes and lobbies governments and regulators. So we can't get away them. from growth at the moment? Well, no, but I, I think the only way we get away from it is, I, you're absolutely right, there is the, the lobby group, there is the vested interest that likes to do it the way it is. A lot of what we've got kind of come, came from what we had, so that plastics is usually part of the, when you're, you're getting crude oil out of the ground, you'll turn some into petrol, you'll have leftover stuff, you turn that into short tra chain and make it into some kind of plastic. Um, there's a lot of, um, uh, the diesel petrol, for instance, came out of um, heating oil. When people stopped using oil to heat their homes, we had a lot of this sort of stuff left over and people ended up going, oh, we should make diesel cars. Uh, which was a bad idea from the beginning, but anyhow, we've got them. Um, and that, so often it's convenient for the producer rather than the consumer. I do believe if you look at the cars, it is consumer choice where consumers have said... Consumer pressure eventually yeah, led gone, to the no, diesel being demonised. No, I want to demonized. buy a Prius. I don't want to buy the, the diesel Volkswagen. And so now everyone's making electric cars. So it is, it, it, it's yeah, a different I think, kind of donut, I mean, isn't it? I, it, it I go once in, the consumer tells the producer, yeah, who right. listens to the consumer, et cetera, et cetera, then you arrive yeah. at that, that more yeah. harmonious point. Yeah. It is essentially about growth, but just different kind of growth. I mean, if you have growth in a, in a toned way, of course, you still have a growth. You still have but growth. it's still, you know, you have a different qualitative kind of growth. And that's really the, at the heart of it. And I think this is, if you're looking for, you know, where to put the plane, I mean, I agree, it's par partially it's the lobby and all that, but it's also really the economics around this, so the mainstream economics, as you said as well, Kate, has really had a very big difficulty in dealing with those issues. And the entire idea that the market actually can be shaped, or our market should have a purpose in mind. Why do we have a market uh, for this and that? So that should have a publicly defined yeah. purpose. And that's... So, so next yeah. time I turn on the radio and hear the UK's GDP figures, I should say, well, it's not worth even listening to, should I? Well, what you're hearing is the total financial value of goods and services that were sold in the UK in the last quarter. Yeah. Well, what was bought and sold? Yeah. You know, if my kids hold a yard sale and say, hey, mum, we made 100 pounds, and I say, well done, kids, what did you, oh, we sold the cat. Actually, <laughs> we sold your car. We sold everything, the contents of the fridge. You know, it matters what we buy and sell. And so let's get away from this number, which Simon Kuznets, its creator, warned us against in the first place. Let's start looking at the 21st century in the metrics we know matter. Are we starting to live back within the means of the planet? Are we cutting our use of carbon emissions? Are we beginning to recycle and regenerate and refurbish, reuse? Are we actually distributing the wealth of this nation and all nations far more equitably amongst all their people? Are we investing in people's health and education? Are we creating strong societies? We know how to measure this stuff. So let's talk about that, not hide from the facts that it's difficult by just ta touting a rising GDP. Will we get there? Well, I think that we will if we... If we you know, ask for it. And the more people that understand that GDP is a measure, but it's the only measure. It's like measuring someone's height without measuring their weight, you know, and, it, it, you know, and saying, oh, it's okay because I'm really tall. And you're going, no, you're really overweight. You know? So you've got to measure more things because I, I think also people, when they left the fields and went to the factories and they started to get more money, 
they lost a lot of community and they lost a lot of other things that are not actually valued. You know, no one puts a number on it. Quality, not quantity. You know, it's, yeah, and it's, it's, it's also about really political behavior, not only as a consumer, how do we behave, but also as we, how do we behave politically and what, what kind of policies and politics we support and what do we de demand as, as citizens and voters. I think so in, in that sense, the, the problem really is that we are dealing with sort of an intergenerational problem. So there's the climate change effects are coming for our children and people like mm. that are not around this table, perhaps. So this is the real, how do you make these kind of problems real for us today? And that takes a concerted effort from, from all policy makers, from mm. companies, from academics. And I think there is a, you can see the change is coming. And it's also now, I think, really for politicians to take the uh, charge. Uh, uh, politicians and, and the people. Listen, yes. before this program, I thought it might be a little bit dry, but I have thoroughly enjoyed oh. sitting with three economists who care. Thank you very, very much indeed. And um, the idea apparently is you've got to ask for change. So if you're out there and you know who to ask, go ahead and do it. Thank you very much for taking part in the program. Time has, has flashed past for me. Um, I hope it has for you. We'll see you next time. Goodbye for now.